Hey, my name's Johnny Gaskell and I'm one of the marine biologists here on Daydream Island and one of the things I do here is look after the coral restoration program. This here in front of you is our coral raceways. So these have got fragments in them that were collected from the marina just over here. And we're going to grow these fragments to a suitable size to be outplanted over the back of the resort at a cyclone damage site. So hopefully this will assist with the recovery of that site. And I thought this would be a good spot to answer your questions because I can use some of these corals and give you a bit of an insight into the world of restoration. So the first question is from Barbara. After corals go fluorescent slash pale under stress, when the stress is lifted, does it follow the same path? As in, do the corals become fluoro bright again when taking on algae? That's a really interesting question. I'm glad you asked that one. So what I'm gonna have to do to answer that question is give you a little bit of a background on bleaching and corals in general. If you look at this coral here, you can see two colors. The brown color underneath is an algae that lives inside the coral's body tissue. It's called zooxanthellate. And that algae photosynthesizes, so it uses the sun's energy and converts that energy into carbohydrates that feeds the coral. And 90% of the coral's energy comes from the zooxanthellate. The yellow, these are fluorescent proteins that you can see in the absence or because the algae isn't present at the tips. And these fluorescent proteins are used to protect the coral from the sun. So they're kind of like a little bit like sunscreen. So you can see two different colors. Now when corals bleach, when the water gets too warm above the coral's natural high range and sustains that temperature for too long, so let's just say this coral normally lives in 29 degree maximum water in the middle of February, and the water gets too warm, say 30 degrees, stays 30 degrees for too long, and combined with the sunlight, the zooxanthellae, the brown stuff, produces too much oxygen, and that oxygen becomes toxic to the body tissue of the coral. So what the coral does is it ditches the zooxanthellae and ends up looking like that. It could also look like that. So this one is just bleached white, this one is fluorescing. Now they're both at the same stage, this one's recovering a little bit at the back, but they're both at the same stage. This one has, could possibly have fluorescent proteins, but sometimes they're invisible, so it just looks pure white. This one clearly has fluorescent proteins because you can see the purple on the top. So that's the difference in some looking fluorescent and some looking more of a white color. Now when they recover, we're noticing in, the, in these raceways here, we're noticing that depending on the species, they recover completely different. We've got one coral over the back here that went from a nice browny, bluey color to fluorescent blue purple six weeks ago, and it's still the same color, it hasn't changed at all. Then we've got other colors, col corals that went from a browny color, more like these ones, so you can see the brown underneath, to completely white in a few days. So really quick bleaching. With the recovery, we're finding that the recovery is a lot slower which is to be expected. This is a good example of a coral that's recovered. Covered. So this was a kind of a light orange color and it was really white at the bottom. It was pretty much all bleached, but slowly the algae came back. About a week ago we started noticing it and the zooxanthellae or the algae started growing back up. So this coral is returning to its normal color and it looks like this one's gonna be okay. Now it doesn't mean they all do that, it does depend on the species, depends on the individual. These two species are the same, so they're both, one has different colored fluorescent proteins than the other one, which are kind of really light orange or clear. So it does definitely depend. So I hope that answers the question, but basically it depends on the coral and depends on the species as well. But what we see is whatever color they go after they bleach, whether it be fluorescing or white, we're seeing them hold that color until they either unfortunately die or regain their zooxanthellae, which means they're all good. Okay, the next question from Explore Tropical North Queensland. What is your favorite coral species and why? I definitely know the answer to this question. 
My favourite coral species is the plate coral. And the reason is, uh, when you go exploring out in the reef, for me there's nothing better than coming across a city of plates, which basically is just plate corals everywhere. The whole top of the coral shelf is just covered in these big circular different coloured plate corals. Uh, I do have an example of a plate coral here, although when they're frags they don't really look like a plate, but imagine this spreading out over a big distance and creating a big circle, and that's what they look like. So, seeing these big plate colonies out in the wild is just incredible, and one of the really amazing sights you can see is where the plates are stacked below each other all the way down the reef shelf, which is really cool. And they're really important corals because they create lots of microhabitats for different species that live in and around the reef. The next question is from Kelsey. Kelsey and this, the plate corals kind of lead into this question. Um, are crown of thorns still a threat? The answer is yes, and plate corals, my favorite, are one of the corals that are impacted most by crown of thorns. The reason you probably don't hear a lot about crown of thorns at the moment, or potentially the reason, is because of where it's occurring. There is a big outbreak occurring down in the Swains, which is about 250 kilometers offshore. There's really just fishing boats, research boats, and a couple of private boats that go out there, so there isn't any day trips to head out to the Swains with tourists to go snorkeling. So for that reason, a lot of it is unseen, and a lot of it doesn't get reported back to the community. So the cots are still in plague proportion down there and they have caused quite a, a big drama down at Swains this year and the last year as well. Around the more the areas where there's more tourism like Sundays and Cairns, there's obviously breaks, uh, outbreaks every now and then, but at the moment it doesn't seem to be anywhere near as bad as what's happening at the Swains. And there are groups out there who are coming up with um, different methods to help mitigate or stop the plague proportions getting so intense. Next question is from Jalara. What is the best thing we can do to help our coral reefs? Well, as you probably all know, the what is impacting coral reefs the most is global warming. So anything you can do in your life, which can be little things, anything you can do to lessen your carbon footprint helps. So turn your lights off when you don't need them. Uh, don't use air conditioning if you don't need to use it. See if you can dry, uh, walk to work, don't drive to work. Um, eat less red meat if you can and buy less stuff. All the things that you buy that you don't use, the manufacturing that goes into those products is just becomes a waste if it's something you don't need. And that one of those things can be clothes. So obviously reuse clothes as much as you can. Another thing you can do is visit the reef. So by visiting the reef, one, you, you get to see what the Great Barrier Reef is, and once you swim or snorkel in the Great Barrier Reef, you're going to want to protect it. It's such an amazing ecosystem, and it blows everyone away. So going to the reef is obviously going to help inspire you to make these little changes, and it also helps because the tourism industry, when people visit the reef, a lot of the money that goes into tourism actually goes into research and into restoration. The program we uh, running at the moment wouldn't have happened without tourism. So it is an important thing that you visit the reef if you get the chance. And the next question is from Kate. What are the fastest and slowest growing coral species? Well, we have one here. The fastest, or one of the fastest growing coral species is the staghorn coral. Uh, this one here, we actually cut this frag about there. And that was about two and a half months ago. A ruler handy. So that's grown about three and a half centimetres in two and a half months. I don't have a calculator, but it's around 15, 14 to 15 centimetres, maybe 16 centimetres a year. And that's pretty average. So these types of corals, the staghorn corals, grow anywhere between about 15 to 20 centimetres per year, which probably doesn't seem like much, but when you've got to produce a calcium carbonate skeleton and you've got to replicate your polyps. And in the conditions that these guys live in, it, 15 to 20 centimeters is, is a pretty good effort. The slowest growing coral, or one of the slowest, um, is a local species called the boulder coral, uh, a type of Porites coral. The boulder coral is also referred to as the massive coral because they are massive and they look like a boulder. 
they only grow about one to two centimeters per year. So they're only a very slow growing coral, but they're an important coral. Because they get so big, they actually create the foundation for entire mini ecosystems. They grow these giant big shapes. The top usually dies when it hits the surface or gets close to where the surface is. And then other corals and other species can all grow on top of it. So it's common to find these huge big ecosystems based on just the foundation of a boulder coral. From Amy, what's it like diving the blue hole? I do like a blue hole. Um, I guess for me, what I love about the blue holes uh, is when you get inside, it's so peaceful, there's no current, the water's just stagnant, it's like it's slack tied the whole time. And all of the animals seem to, I don't know if I'm just imagining it, but they seem to act different. The corals grow in really weird formations. So these corals grow, particularly staghorn corals, grow these long branches that just keep going and they're all twisted around and they don't have any environmental influence. So the way they grow, they grow however they want. There's no currents, there's no big waves, there's no storm damage in there. So it's really interesting to see how the corals grow inside the blue hole. So that's one of the coolest things about um, diving in the blue holes. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your isolation. And I hope I answered a few of your questions and hopefully you learnt something today. When you get a chance to explore again, hopefully one day we'll see you here on the island. Thanks.